Something my dad would always say is, come on! My dad always says, Luke, I am your father. Something my dad always says is, talk to Goose. Mm -hmm. My dad says, thank you, I always says, I'll, I'll see you for supper. My dad always tells me to get my shoes out of the living room. I'll never forget my dad saying, um, stay in bed. <laughs> One thing that my dad always says is that I'm cute, but I'm trouble. I'll never forget my dad telling me I'm special. Whenever my dad drops me off at school, he tells me to go be magnificent. One thing I remember my dad telling me was that you're never gonna regret taking the time to help someone out. You'll only regret it if you don't do it. The thing I hear my dad say the most is I got it. No matter if it's taking the trash out, um, going to the store, or really anything that just needs to get done, the first thing that he says is I got it. I'll never forget when my dad built me a swing set all by himself. Uh, I... Um, I love my dad more than his famous list. My dad always says I love you. I love my dad. Uh, I love my dad. <laughs> That's awesome. If you would stand as we uh, begin our worship service this morning.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you with us. I want to welcome you to Forum. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. My dad is visiting with us from out of town, so I'm going to, I'm going to brag on him in a little bit. It's going to make you uncomfortable, and that's going to be okay. Uh, maybe uh, nobody else in my life besides Jesus and the Apostle Paul uh, have impacted my life more than, than you, Dad. So I wanted to say thanks for that, number one. Uh, and much of what I've learned from you hasn't just been what you've said. It's how I've seen that paired with your life. And that has been really explosive for me. I, I, I often will say this, that I'm standing on your shoulders. Um, and I want to tell a story that I remember only a little fragment of. And we were, we were on a family vacation in Colorado. And we were driving in the mountains. And my parents were in the front seat having a conversation. It was late at night. And all I, I just remember this this sort of green glow of the dashboard, you know, like from cars from the late 80s, you know what I'm saying? There weren't many colors on the dashboard, just a green color. And I can remember their silhouettes, and, and I was listening. You might have thought I was asleep, but I was listening. Kids are always listening. Parents, listen. Your kids are always listening to you, <laughs> whether good or bad. And I remember my dad, I can remember this look, so I could paint this picture. My dad is looking at my mother and he says, our love is a decision. And for whatever reason, that one statement just embedded itself into my heart and into my mind. And I've been living out of that investment my entire life. And it, I have seen it practically. I've seen it in your life. I've seen it in my life. Love is so much more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling, some hot pink version we get from Hollywood. It is an act of the will. It's a decision of the mind, and it absolutely involves the totality of our heart. And to see that in practice is so profound. I'm going to use it, actually, as a metaphor for this entire teaching series that we're starting today, of which there's only two parts, so like we're almost 50% done with this series. But we're really going to talk about this idea of those, those tiny little investments that we can sometimes make into the lives of others those tiny little investments that we make into our relationship to God or into other areas, whether it's our finances or it's our health, it's work, it's people, some of those investments will have incredible returns. The things produced from those investments will be almost unquantifiable. I'm a benefactor today from an investment that was made in my life years and years and years ago, over 30 years ago, that I'm still benefiting from today. And if we knew ahead of time the investments that we're making are going to change people's lives. How much more would we do them? And so we're going to use this term throughout this series known as ROI. And it stands for return on investment. I know those of you in the world of academics and, and IT, information technologies, or in the world of medicine, when you hear ROI, uh, you hear request of information. It's not what we're talking about this series. We're going to go from this sort of financial perspective. For those of you who have ever looked at your own finances, managed your retirement, managed a portfolio in any way, th this term is really familiar. And it simply means this. We will invest in certain things, and then we just look and see what, what's produced, what's the byproduct, or what's the return on that investment. It's really easy to think about in terms of finances. Uh, you know, if I invest $100 into a company, a mutual fund, or a stock, I want to get a high rate of return on that investment. I want that money to make me more money. That makes a lot of sense. 
But while we don't necessarily use that term ROI, we talk about its principles all the time, especially when it comes to our finances. There are certain things that we spend our money on. It doesn't actually produce anything. There's no return on what we give our money to. There are some things that we put money into. It actually takes more of our money. Now, we don't use this term ROI, but we're always kind of sizing up. Is this really a good investment? Is this going to last? This is the discussion I had with my wife when I was trying to buy a chainsaw. I was like, if I buy that chainsaw, I'm going to probably have to buy another chainsaw in a couple years. But if I buy that chainsaw, that's going to last forever. It's a good return on our investment. It was the same kind of conversation, but I wasn't talking, I didn't use that term ROI, but I was talking about the principles. The same thing is true. You ever bought a car? You drove that car off the lot, guess what? It depreciated in value just because you drove it off the lot. Good return on the investment? Well, not from a financial sense. Think about how much we spend our time and energy and money, and what is the return on that? We may not use the term, but we use the principle. Now, think about this or shift out of finances. We use this kind of language all the time when we talk about our health. We don't use the term ROI, but we often will talk about the way that we feel physically, whether positive or negative. We're always talking about the food that we eat. That's basically all we talk about as humans, right? That's a discussion about a return on investment because there are some things that you can eat that actually make you feel pretty good. And then there's like the stuff that I like to eat. It doesn't make me feel super good. It tastes really good in the moment. But have you ever thought about that in terms of the investment that you're making? Because, you know, I've heard this from more than a few people, especially today. It's been surprising how many people have commented on this one little section. The choices that we make with the food that we, we eat and whether we choose to invest in an active lifestyle and whether we choose to invest in a good night's rest, that has everything to do with how healthy we are. Now, we'll have conversations about how unhealthy we are, how healthy we want to be, but are we making the investment into those areas of our life? We talk about it all the time. We may not use this term, but we explore the principles often. And we're doing this probably more than any other area of our life when it comes to our relationships. Because you know this just like I do. There are just certain people in our life, it doesn't matter what we invest into them. Time, energy, and resources, there's just not too much is ever produced. Now, of course, it's not the person you're sitting with today, so everybody in the room is excluded from this. But we all have people like this in our life. They seem to be a black hole of resources. And I don't think, honestly, they can, they can, they can help it. And we could have a separate conversation after the service about what to do when you have a relationship like that. It usually starts off with a, a conversation about healthy boundaries. But you also know those people in your life. You spend five seconds with them, and they just pour a little bit of sunshine into you. You spend a lunch or an afternoon with them, and it's like they're just overflowing with joy, and it just changes you. You got these people in your life? I like to be around these kind of people. I married one of these people. I like to hang out with her a lot because she just brings this joy with her everywhere she goes, and it changes things, things that look dark and gloomy. You know, you throw my wife in there, suddenly it becomes a radiant place to be. I think you and I, we, we use the principle of return on investment a lot, though we may not use that term ROI. Now let's push beyond just finances and health and relationships into our spiritual life. And let me just ask you right now, what are you investing your time, energy, and resources into? And I, I use those three terms, time, energy, and resources, because those are the three things that God has given to every single one of us. Regardless of what you got going on in your life, if you're here today, he's given you time. And if you're here today, you have energy because you physically moved your body into this building. And every single person in this room is managing some kind of resource Think of your finances, think of your assets, the clothes on your back, to the cars that you drive, to the home or apartment that you live in, to the skills, talents, and abilities that God has gifted you with. What are you investing them in? And how are you right now investing into your relationship to God? And this, this last, this fourth quadrant is a little bit more challenging to think about because when it comes to faith, 
often we can, we can make it so nebulous. We're like, oh yeah, believe in God, have faith in God. We don't really see the practical side of it, how it gets played out in daily life. And that's really what we're going to do in this series. We're going we're gonna to talk about how our investment into our relationship to God and our relationship to others gets played out real practically in everyday life. And so what I want us to do as we get a little bit further into this discussion, I want us to really see the entire series through a single challenge. You know, if you're with us uh, in our last series, we just closed up a seven-week series studying through 2 Timothy. We let a single question guide us through that series. But this time, we're going to let a single challenge guide us. And the challenge is, you know, let's, let's reconsider our investment strategy. And when I say investment strategy, I simply mean what are we investing in and what are the returns? What's being produced by those investments? I'm going to challenge all of us throughout the series to just reconsider, what, just to think, what is my investment strategy? And maybe it's time to reconsider the things that I'm putting my time, energy, and resources into because maybe they're not, maybe they're not actually producing anything good. And I want to I actually take this challenge and I want us to ask Jesus Let's just imagine really quickly, we're talking to Jesus. This is sometimes how I talk to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what should we invest in? And what do you think he would say? Here's what, I've given you time, I've given you energy, I've given you resources, I've given you thousands of days upon the earth. And here's what I want you to do with them. Here's what I want you to spend your time doing. What do you think he would say? People, that's good. I love it when the crowd is responsive, just in case you feel that urge to say something, you can say something. The only danger is I might address you and we might start having a conversation. What do you think you would say? Now here's the beautiful thing. He has said, he's actually told us this numerous times. And I want to go into one of these conversations that he had with one of the religious elite, one of the most brilliant thinkers of his day. And they asked him this question. And the text says in Matthew chapter 22, an uh, expert in the religious law. This is kind of the language of, this is the PhD tenured professor from Harvard. They came up to Jesus and said, I've got a question. Now he's trying to trap him. It, his, his motives and intentions were not pure, but watch how Jesus responds. They say, hey, uh, what's the most important command in the law of Moses? Like, what's the thing that God really wants us to do? Now, he's not using the language of ROI, but it's the same principle. Now, if we were to do a study of ancient Jewish thought and, and re religious sort of scholarship around the law of Moses, we would see an entire nation of people putting an emphasis on certain commands or teachings over others. And they would let the larger or the heavier command actually filter the way they understood the lesser commands. So this is a legitimate question. What's the most important part of the law of Moses? What should be our focus? Or we would say it like this, what should we invest our time, energy, and money in? What, what does God want from us? We've got a certain number of days on the earth. What should we do with them? And Jesus says, oh, this is very simple. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. I learned this from my dad. Love is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. It, it encompasses the entirety of your being. And we put that towards our relationship to God. Number one, he says this is the first and it's the greatest. There's nothing more important than this. And we could just really quickly stop here and go, what am I investing in right now? What should my investment strategy be according to Jesus? Now, he goes on to say, but there's another one. It's as equally important. And when he says second, he doesn't mean second in order of priority or prominence. He means it's the second of two, meaning there's two number ones. Number one is love God, and number one is love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and the prophets are based on these two commandments. He summarizes the entire Old Testament in two things. So we ask this question, okay, so what should I invest my time, energy, and resources into? Jesus, your relationship to God, and your relationship to others. 
And it's a love relationship. Not a warm, fuzzy feeling kind of love. The all-encompassing, immerse yourself, self-sacrificial, heart, mind, and soul kind of love. And I think it's really important for us to consider, am I, am I like living that? Am I investing into those things? You look out over the landscape of your life and go, what do I see? What is the byproduct of what I've been investing into? So let's reconsider our investment strategy. I want to add just one little subtitle here, according to Jesus. Let's reconsider our investment strategy, but let's not do it according to financial analysis. Let's not do it according to your doctor or your health coach or your nutritionist. Let's not do it according to maybe your counselor or relationships that you're in. Let, let's, let's think about this according to Jesus. And, and this is going to be the framework for this entire series. Reconsidering our investment strategy according to Jesus. And the way that we're going to get into this is it's just going to be so much fun. So come with me in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to study through 2 Corinthians chapter 8 today, and we're going to do chapter 9 next Sunday. And we're going to see something so brilliant come out of this text. And so if you can imagine, that's the heart of what we're doing. We're going to let the, the text shape us and mold us and transform us. So if that's the main idea, we're going to we're going to take the back roads to get there. Okay, we're going to go on this winding, scenic route. I got any back roads people in the room today? Any back roads? Let's roll them windows down. I know it's hot. Roll them down. And let's turn that music up. And let's go cruising on these back roads. And where it's going to take us, it's going to be, it's going to be beautiful in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the beginning of this back road journey is going to start with something called the Jerusalem Collection. Now, this is, this is such a fascinating study because really what we're doing when we talk about the Jerusalem collection, and I know for many of you, this is like, I have no idea what that is. We're going to unpack it over the next 10 minutes here. There was a collection being taken by the earliest followers of Jesus for the believers in Jerusalem really right at the beginning of the start of the church. So imagine earliest followers of Jesus, there was a lot of need, and so you have these churches all over the known Roman world taking up offerings to help other people in need. Now here's the thing, you don't read really about it in the New Testament other than these almost passing historical references. And so if you've never heard of it, I don't blame you, there are these little blips, just a couple verses here and there, but when we look at all of them, we're going to see a beautiful tapestry being woven here. And so we're going to look at what, we're really just going to ask this question first. What, what is this Jerusalem collection you're speaking about? I'm so glad you asked that. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm going to go all the way back to the book of Acts. The book of Acts in the New Testament is a historical document about the earliest followers of Jesus and really what happened after the resurrection. So Jesus comes to this earth, lives a perfect sinless life, makes disciples, pronounces to the world the kingdom of God. Then he crawls up on a cross of his own will so that the, the penalty for sin, which is death, could be paid in full. He was victorious and triumphant over that death. He didn't just die. He came back from the dead. And he started showing up for over a month to over 500 people in different locations and at different times. And he was like, here, touch me. Put your hand in the wound. Let's go have dinner. Come on, let's go for a walk. I got to tell you guys some things. It's been one of the most difficult historical realities for skeptics and scholars alike to disprove because there's so much eyewitness testimony for this guy who came back from the dead. Because I don't know if you know this, dead people don't come back to life. So he's showing up all over the place, and people are writing it down and talking about it. And it's been very hard for skeptics and scholars throughout the years to disprove. So he gathers his disciples. Before he ascends into heaven, he gathers his disciples and says, I want you to go and do for others what I've done for you. I want you to go make disciples. I want you to baptize people. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I want you to teach them everything that I've taught you. I want you to teach them how to obey it. I want you to teach them how to live this life. And remember, I'm always going to be with you because here's the thing. 
I'm going to leave, and I want you guys to go to Jerusalem, and while you're there, I'm going to send my spirit to empower you to carry out this mission. You're not going to be able to do it without my power and strength at work in your life. And I'm telling you what, the day the spirit was poured out onto those believers, it was nothing less than a gospel explosion. And as the words of truth about Jesus were being proclaimed for the first time, thousands of people were coming to faith in Jesus. Thousands. And so we find in Acts chapter 6, as the believers rapidly multiplied, you guys aren't going to believe this, there were rumblings of discontent. As there are more and more Jesus followers gathered in a room, they were unhappy about some things. Like, these are our people, right? That's like, that sounds like us. Nobody's with me. That's fine. The Greek-speaking believers were complaining about the Hebrew-speaking believers. And the reason why they were complaining is because their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now, we read this as, as just like a little historical tidbit. What was happening in Jerusalem There was extreme poverty amongst the Jesus followers. And, you know, we could do a little historical study about 2,000 years ago and life in Jerusalem and who were the outcasts and the marginalized and and had a hard time, like, putting food on the table. It was the lowest rung of the, the social economic ladder, which was the slaves and widows. And so what did the followers of Jesus do? They started a food program to meet the needs of people. So what do we see in Acts chapter 6? We see followers of Jesus stepping up and stepping in. Now watch this. So the 12, they call a meeting of the believers and they say, you know, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. So they selected seven men, well-respected, full of the spirit and wisdom, and we'll give them this responsibility. Then when the apostles Now we can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word of God. There's something really, really important here I want to point out. That as the believers began to grow in number, the needs began to grow, and the apostles realized, oh, we got to get organized. We're going to put our time, energy, and resources into proclaiming the gospel and also in helping others. And guess what? Uh, Hey, let's, let's get moving. We're going to preach and pray. Let's help, let's help feed some people. And you can read really quickly. Uh, everybody liked this idea. So they chose these seven guys, and God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were now being converted too, because there was this truth that was being paired with real practical life. It wasn't just a message of love and hope and grace. It was the demonstration of that super practically in helping people where they are. And what happened as a byproduct of those little incremental investments, people came to know the truth. Even people who you would think would not come to know the truth, which is what the author is saying here by the priests, even some of the priests, oh my goodness. That's like saying, yeah, people from the nation of Islam were being converted. That's how powerful this was. Now, We're going to flash forward just a little bit in time, really not too much. We're going to Acts chapter 11. It says, during this time, some of the prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. That's from Jerusalem, think lower quarter, Antioch, traveling up north. One of them was uh, named Agabus. He stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch, listen to this. They decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea. That's Jerusalem. They decided, what, what's going to happen? There's a famine. Guys, we got to do something. We got to help. There's people in need. We should, do, we, should, we should get involved. And everybody was giving as much as they could. This is not the language being used here of like, well, they decided... You know, I could probably, you know, is five bucks enough? Just pass a can around and we'll just put a little something in there. This was like this sense of urgency around the need. Let's give as much as we can. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Then we start chapter 12 and it's a blip. It's like never mentioned again. 
What's going on in the background of the New Testament? There's people in need, and there's people rising up to meet that need based on two fundamental principles, preaching and proclamation of the gospel and, and literally walking with people wherever they are. You're hungry? Let's talk about what, what getting some food looks like. There's a great famine coming. What does that mean? That means farmers are going to be out of work. What does that mean? Can you imagine the impact in a community with a famine you and I, you don't have to look through too many headlines to see this happening in our world today, and you see how the economic impact of a famine really hits into every area of life, both financial, both with health, both relationally. But what about that spiritual component? I would actually look out over the landscape of our culture right now and say, I think uh, we don't have a famine when it comes to economics. We may have a crisis in health and relationships, and an absolute famine and drought when it comes to the spiritual things. But all you have to do is go, why? And then ask, well, what are we investing in? And suddenly things become pretty clear. Oh, we're just seeing the result, the return on the things we've been investing in. It has looked different for followers of Jesus for thousands of years. Now, I'm going to go into another passage. This is probably one of the greatest works ever created by the Spirit of God through a human known as the Apostle Paul. He writes this letter to the Romans, this little community of Jesus followers in Rome. He, he says this all, just totally in passing. He's like talking about his travel plans in chapter 15. He says, listen, I'm, I'm finished my work in these regions and after all these long years of waiting, I'm so eager to visit you. I'm planning to go to Spain and when I do, I'm going to stop off in Rome. And after I've enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, you can help me and provide for my journey. Just like, ah, here's here's my itinerary. Oh, but before I come, I got to go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Now, what do we know about this Jerusalem gift? We know that from the very beginning, People in Jerusalem were struggling. The believers set up a food pantry. We know not too long after that, there was a famine that swept through the land. And the believers were taking up a collection. Now, what he's going to say here in Romans 15, he's going to give us the heart behind it. He's going to tell us why. He says, verse 27 of chapter 15, they were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them. What's, why do they feel a debt to them? Why do they feel like they owe something to the believers in Jerusalem? He says it like this. Well, the Gentiles, they receive the spiritual blessings of the gospel from the believers in Jerusalem. So they feel that the least that they can do in return is to help them financially. Do you see this beautiful connection there? I'm going to pull up a map here. This is, um, okay, so Jerusalem is just uh, right down here. And if, if this map continued, this would be Italy right here. So this is Achaia, and this is Macedonia. Now, it's a little bit hard for you to see, but I'm going to read off some of the names of these cities. In Achaia, there's a city known as Corinth. We're going to be in Corinthians. It was a letter written to the church at Corinth which is right next to Athens. So this is the lower part of Greece. The upper part of Greece, named Macedonia back then, we see cities as Thessalonica and Philippi. And over in this region over here is the region of Galatia. And these are all going to be really, really important for us. But I want us to just get into our mind. There's churches up here. There's churches down here. And Paul is talking about churches in Achaia and Macedonia taking up a collection to people they've never even met who are suffering all the way over here. And the reason why is because they have heard the gospel that that rang out from Jerusalem. Remember what Jesus said? I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. And it's just rippling out. You You know what's really fascinating? One of the primary tools that was used to spread the message, how, how we got so many Christians in this region, you know what one of the reasons was? It was persecution. As Christians in Jerusalem were being hunted and killed, 
they, they left. <laughs> and with them, they took the hope of the world. And the light of the gospel began to flood into these regions. And they're like, there are strangers over there. Who we, we feel indebted to them because of what they've invested into our life. We can't even quantify. If we could just help out with a little bit of financial help, pff, totally. And I think this, this should probably hit some chord with, with many of us because we have these people in my life. They've made such an investment into us that you would probably do anything for them at a, at a, in a moment's notice at a drop of a hat. This is kind of that heart level of love that we've been talking about. It's more than a warm, fuzzy feeling. And I want us to really see that the Jerusalem gift wasn't really just about money. It was about the gospel and helping people. And that took money sometimes. And so Paul's just saying, man, these believers are really stepping up. And now watch what he says next. So as soon as I've delivered the money and completed this good deed of theirs, I'm going to come to see you on my way to Spain. And then he just keeps on talking like, no big deal. The Jerusalem collection is just running in the background of the historical narrative of the New Testament. Now, come with me to the first letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And in the very last chapter, chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, he's writing to this church down here. He just says, oh, hey, uh, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, what is that? That's the Jerusalem collection. Just follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. So he's telling all these followers of Jesus, here's how we can help. Here's what we can do. I know we're separated by hundreds and hundreds of miles, but you can help people in need. You may not be able to physically go there, but I'm going there. You want to help? I'll take it with me. Just follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, put aside a portion of the money that you've earned. Just set some money aside to help some other people. Don't wait until I get there and try to collect it all at once. That doesn't make any sense. When I come, I'll write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver the gift to Jerusalem. And if it's possible, I'll come a long way. I'll just, I'll go with you. And then he just keeps talking. This little blip. If you aren't careful, you, you might miss the beauty of the Jerusalem collection that's going on behind the scenes throughout the New Testament. And we've taken the back roads. The windows were down. We went pretty fast through those hills, but we're here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Paul's writing a second letter to this church at Corinth. He's already told them what's going on. He's told them how, the real practical side. Not only has he communicated the heart behind it, but also the practical side of it. This is like literally how we live out our faith. And he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. So we know where Macedonia is, right? That was that upper region. Churches like Philippi and Thessalonica. But this word that he uses here in the original language of which he wrote this letter in Greek, this is the Greek word charis, which means grace. God's grace is just flooding out of these churches in Macedonia. Paul's like, I got to tell you about what God is doing in those churches. They, they are going through such difficult times. They're having difficulty, such hard circumstances. And they're super poor. But do you know what they have? They ain't got a lot of money. They don't have easy living. But they have an abundance of joy. Now, I think this should, should really start speaking right into our hearts. Because many of us, we let our circumstances and the bottom line of our finances dictate what we think God is doing in our life. Was God's grace limited by their circumstances? No. Was God's grace at work in their life limited by their bank statement? No. Did they have a lack of joy in their life because they were going through difficult times and didn't have enough money? No. The language he uses, abundance, is like, imagine uh, a glass and it's overflowing with water. Like there's no more room in their life for all the joy that they have. 
Now, just really quickly. Is that the return you're getting on, on some investments in your life? I think that should challenge us. I think it should challenge us to reconsider our investment strategy according to Jesus because we're seeing something here. We're seeing an investment strategy and we're seeing some returns. And that, that grace producing joy in their life is coming out real practically. S same root word used here for overflowed. There's an abundance of generosity. They are poor monetarily, but rich in what they're willing to give. You and I have been convinced that the opposite is true. That when the bank account is full, that's when I'll be able to be rich in generosity. And I would, I would just challenge you, where did you get that from? Where does that idea come from? Does that come from Jesus? I don't think it does. And if you've at any point in your life said, I, could, I don't know if I have an abundance of joy. And I don't feel very generous. It's something to lean into. Now I can testify that they didn't just give what they could afford. They didn't just write it into their budget. They didn't just do a calculation and go, well, I'll do 10%. They went above and beyond that. They excelled in their giving and they did it of their own free will. They didn't need somebody to tell them, hey, you should give. Hey, we're doing this thing for these people. You need to cough it up. He's like, do you see what God's grace does in people's lives? It fills them with joy. That joy real practically comes out in generosity. That's, that's just what they want to do. They, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Now, we know what this gift is, right? We know why. We know they were hurting. We know that it was moving the hearts of others because they felt a debt to them because of the gospel that had transformed their life. And they thought we need to be helping each other. That's been the bedrock and pillar of the church for 2,000 years. It's really practical. But I want to point something out here. This language of begging, is we could translate this pleaded with a great sense of urgency, they fell on their knees and begged us for something. I can't help but think about my kids wanting to go to Andy's ice cream when I read this word. They're like, please, Dad, please. That's the heart behind it. I mean, just hold on a second. How many of us have ever in our life begged to give like anything? Maybe we need to, maybe it's time we reconsider our investment strategy according to Jesus. Because what if this isn't, what if this isn't weird? What if this wasn't just for believers 2,000 years ago? What if this is an invitation for us to really rethink maybe everything in our life? Because if you're like me and you could use a little bit more joy, a little bit more overflowing, maybe, maybe the byproduct of that joy is generosity. Where do I get the joy from? Well, that comes from the grace of God. Now we can start talking about what are we investing in? Now watch what he says next. They, they did even more than we had hoped for. But I want you to realize their first action, the first thing that they did, he's just talking about the teaching of Jesus here. They gave themselves to the Lord. What was the first thing that they did? They gave themselves to the Lord. What was the first thing they did? They connected into their relationship to God and their relationship to others. I was having a conversation with somebody in the lobby after last service, and you know what they said? I want to give myself to the Lord. And I want to be baptized. I was like, that's amazing. You want to do it right now? And she was like, yes. I want to do it right now. I want to be in a right relationship with God right now. And her fiance who was with her was like, for real, right now? You're not hungry, you know? And she was like, no, right now. And, sh and she started kind of doing this little mini sermon towards him. Like, this is really important to me. The forgiveness that comes through Jesus. I was like, that's, yes, preach, you know? <laughs> My job was very easy. And so after the last service, she went into the waters of baptism and came up. And she could not get up those stairs before the tears came down. And she was like, I'm saved. 
He saved me. And I'm like, is there anything more valuable to the heart of her father than to have his daughter run into his arms? Is there any greater investment than to give yourself to the Lord? There's not. And to let that pour out into the lives of others because that isn't a message you just say, oh, I'm so glad for me and Jesus now. It's a message that we get to tell people. Let me tell you, this is what Paul's doing in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Let me tell you what the grace of God is doing in people's lives. It's going to change everything. Not only did they give themselves to the Lord, they gave them to us. And so we had to urge Titus. You remember Titus? He's talking to the Corinthians. We sent Titus down there. And he was encouraging you about being a part of this gift. And so he's going to come back. We're sending him right back to you and go, what are you doing? There's this whole backstory between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Two letters written to the same church, but there's a lot that happened in between. In the beginning, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, they're like, how can we help? What can we do? And he's like, well, set some money aside. Then when we come to collect it, you'll be all ready. And now in 2 Corinthians, something's happened. And now they're like, well, we wanted to give. But we haven't done anything about it. And I think this is, this is really reflective of many of us. We, we may get stirred up, may get motivated, may see a need or hear about a need and have a stirring in our hearts. But if we're not diligent to demonstrate love, not just in that warm, fuzzy feeling, but also in our actions and our determination, what have we experienced? It's easy to not do anything and to not give, to not proclaim the gospel and help those in need. So he's like, I'm going to come back there. You should finish what you started. I mean, you guys excel in so many different ways. Your faith, you got a bunch of gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and you got our love. We want you to excel, go above and beyond also in this ministry of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this. But I am absolutely testing how genuine your love is. How can you test someone's love? By seeing the eagerness they have to help those in need. Now, he goes straight up Jesus juke on him here. Listen to this. You know the generous grace of Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Like, think about how the gospel, the gospel has transformed your life. Think about what Jesus did. Let that be your pattern and example and your willingness to lay down everything to help other people. Now, finish what you started. Let that eagerness you had in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Let that warm, fuzzy feeling you had translate into actually helping people. This is what I, I often... I get really passionate about It's like, let's stop talking about all the problems. Let's be the solution. Let's take with us the gospel of hope and grace and transformation into all the places that we see that are broken. Let's stop talking about the brokenness and how horrible everything is. Let's bring some sunshine up into there. That's how God has been transforming the world from the very beginning. And who is he asking to do it? He sends us. So whatever you give is acceptable. If you give it eagerly, give according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. He's just reiterating the teaching of Jesus. This is just a very simple principle. Jesus is like, your giving comes from your heart. Stop attaching dollar amounts to it. You got a lot? You should give in proportion to that. I can look out over this room and I know God has gifted some of you with an amazing amount of wealth to manage. And I honestly believe this. The reason why he's given it to you is because you're doing an amazing job of seeing it as a resource to help other people. This is actually a principle we see in the New Testament. So what does he do? He gives you more. I've heard this so many, story from so many of you. It's like, it doesn't make sense the way that he's blessing my life. And so we just keep trying to find ways to give it away. But the moment I give it away, he gives me more. And so now we're just this dispensary of God's blessings. Yes! Let's do that a lot. Let's be those people. Let's be like a light shining in the darkness. What if, what if that's what Christians were known for? Always stepping into those places. What's going on? What's going on? How can I help? What's, what'd you say? What'd you say? How can I help? 
What if that's all we ever did? We saw the things that he entrusted with us as ways that we could bless others. So what's the investment strategy that we see here? Like real practically, we're going to summarize all this really quickly. What's the investment strategy? What's the investment into what and what were the returns? Well, the investment strategy is giving that comes from the heart. Let's not get muddled up in finances and, oh, they're always talking about money. Like, no, this is a heart issue. It was a giving from the heart to the gospel and to helping others. Over here, it was a food pantry. Over here, it's a famine. In our community right now, it looks like all kinds of things. I'm so proud to be a part of this ministry right here. Do you know what happened when the pandemic hit and the entire world turned inward and started stockpiling things? you know what you guys did? You're like, how can we help? We heard that term so many times, we created a button on our website that people, total strangers, could go to our website, click a button, and they can just say, we need help. And we had an army of people going, I'll help. What do you need? You need a ride? Great, I'll help. You need shoes? Great, I'll help. People need food? Great. You need toilet paper? Why do you need toilet paper? (laughs) Oh, the world is out of toilet paper? I got some toilet paper. I'm not kidding. We had a bin sit outside of our lobby front doors, and you know what you guys did? You just filled it with toilet paper. Because people need a toilet paper. Is that, a, is that an issue about money? No, not really. I mean, you had to use money to buy the toilet paper, but it was really about how can we help? May God continue to bless you so that you can continue to bless others. This is beautiful. You know what that is? Oh, that's his grace. Oh, let's not call it anything else other than what it is. That's his grace. And you know what? It's super practical. It comes out in like daily life. Isn't that beautiful? We get to be a part of this. It's so amazing. I think it should motivate us, energize us, make us enthusiastic. So really quickly, uh, what was the investment into the proclamation of God's word into helping others? But what was the return? What was the byproduct of that in their lives? They got to an experience in abundant joy. They were, they were overly generous. They, They were able to provide in ways that they probably were even amazed to see how God was providing through his grace, experiencing joy and that generosity, and they just had an eagerness to help. It's one of the things, if I could commend this ministry for anything, this is where you guys excel. Do I think we're done? No way. Can we do better? For sure. But where does this come from? It comes from his grace. It comes from the gospel, transforming people's lives, filling us up, and we get, you know what happens with a cup that gets full? It gets poured out. You know what God does to an empty cup? He fills it up again. May we excel in our eagerness to help others. Let me challenge you, my friends. Maybe, maybe it's time that we reconsider our investment strategy, and let's do it according to Jesus. It's going to be my, my prayer for us throughout this series, and I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you guys to just be, just be praying to God. Uh, how can I help? God, maybe transform how we think and how I'm managing my money, my health, my relationships, but more importantly, how am I investing into my relationship with you and to others? Pray with me. Our God and and our Father, uh, hear our, hear our, our, our prayer and our confession of our sin. Sin that separated us from you but also hear our gratitude and our thankfulness for the gospel. Hear our thankfulness for Jesus. As we we immerse ourselves into your word and into your way, will you transform us? We, We would love an abundance of joy. We would love to be overly generous and eager to help those in need, but we're not super good at that, so we're just, we're relying and trusting on you. Shape us and mold us. Help us to just see those areas of our life where we need to rethink that investment strategy. Help us to see the returns and the byproducts of what we're spending our time, energy, and resources are so that we can be confronted with the reality that you're inviting us to something more beautiful. Shape us by the truth of the gospel so that we may be a conduit of that grace and that hope and that love in this world starting right now. That's our prayer. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for this community. Thank you, God, for your grace. We pray this in the name of your son. Amen.
Would you stand as we sing a song in preparation for communion? Jesus. 
God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Amen. You have to sing that. 2,000 years ago, the night before Jesus was crucified, he gathered his disciples around a table and he gave them uh, some bread and some wine. He said, this bread that, it's my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he said, and this is my blood that's poured out. Do this in remembrance of me. And for, that, for hundreds of years, 2,000 years now, followers of Jesus have come to this table this time as a reminder of the sacrifice that our God made for us. And I just want to, for a moment, look at, as we look to the cross in this moment, I want to go back into 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and see this gift, this sacrifice through the lens of God's generosity. Chapter 8, verse 9 says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. For years, look to the cross. It is a reminder of the powerful generosity of our Father in heaven who loved all of us so much that he would give us his son. And so as we remember the cross, as we remember the resurrection, I pray that it would propel us to be the embodiment as the body of Christ of his generosity into this world. Let's take communion together. stand as we continue to praise God and thank him for all that he's blessed us with.
to uh, worship with you all this morning, and um, you know, just to be together, we have a lot to be thankful for. We are blessed, and uh, this week, I just pray you'll think about how you use that blessing, how you will invest in uh, the lives of other people, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. Have a great day.